Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who do not know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Hassani Pettifort. I'm the co-founder of Couples Academy, and we are a relationship-based learning institute committed to helping couples by placing them on the path to fulfillment. And every single Monday, we have something called the Infidelity Recovery Call. And it's a Facebook Live experience for those individuals who have experienced the pain of infidelity, whether they are the hurt partner, uh, whether they are, they are the unfaithful partner. But at the end of the day, it's a place to get clarity, understanding, and healing. And, you know, we've had a number of awesome topics over the last couple of months. And this is particularly for uh, a, a woman who sent me an inbox message wanting to know how do you deal with sex after an affair? So tonight's message is, it's complicated, sex after an affair. And I think it's an important topic to really delve into because there's no one response, there's no right or wrong or appropriate response to how to transition into being physically intimate after an affair has occurred. Um, let me just say, after counseling a number of different couples, I've seen all types of responses. There are those um, that during the, what we would call the discovery phase when you first find out and you're emotionally distraught and you feel like just, just ending it all, you're vacillating back and forth, should I stay, should I go? But then there's still a desire on your partner's part to engage in sex. And this is oftentimes the point where you as a hurt partner may have zero desire because every time you see your partner, it's a reminder of what's happened. And so the thought of sex, you begin to imagine in your mind what sex was like for your spouse and that other person. And you begin to compare, well, you know, how do I measure up and did I have a body like that other person? Do I perform like that other person? There must be something wrong with me that led that, that spouse to venture off into an unfamiliar territory to engage in passion with another person. So oftentimes these type of feelings, these thoughts and these emotions cause, causes us to have zero desire for sex. We're still enraged, we're still mad, uh, resentful. Uh, oftentimes there's revenge and you want to punish your partner by not giving them what it is that they desire because you perceive uh, what they want as a selfish act. And so oftentimes no sex is the response. But we do find that another reason why there may be low desirability is because the hurt partner does not always feel as if the unfaithful partner is empathetic to their situation. Like there's no remorse, there's no compassion, you know, they're ready to move on, we're still struggling with what it is that we're going through, but yet they want sex. And so uh, they feel used, they feel abused, they feel like the only reason why you want me is to be physical, but that you don't want me from me. And so the only time that you come knocking on my door or tapping my shoulder is to engage in sex. And so for the hurt partner, oftentimes it feels like what we would call a prostitute John relationship. I'm just offering up my body, it being used as a vessel or a conduit for your particular pleasure. And that is not desirable. Uh, it is not um, ideal for the her partner. And so therefore, there is no sex. But I have also seen situations where the level of passion and intensity with a couple skyrockets. So for instance, if they had an average or basic sexual life within the realm of their marriage, now it's just full blast. And they're engaging in more sex than they've ever had, is more passionate than it's ever been. And oftentimes from the outside looking in, that may be perceived as a good thing. But ultimately there are reasons and motives and intent even behind that. For instance, if I feel, if I'm the hurt partner and I have been cheated on, uh, the reason why I may want to have all types of sex, number one, may be to claim territory. So I've lost you once, I'm not going to lose you again, so I'm going to ensure that you go nowhere. And I'm going to rip and pull every sliver of temptation and desire away from you for anyone else. So I'm going to overcompensate and give you all of me every waking moment, every minute of the day, on a daily basis, because that is what I feel I need to do to solve or fix the problem. Another thing that may be going on is, you know what, feeling of insecurity and inadequacy. So if I feel less than, because oftentimes when a person is cheated on, they feel like they're not enough. 
that there must be something more out there, whether he or she is more attractive than me, whether they have a better personality than me, whether there's some emotional connection that we just don't have. And so what we attempt to do is overcompensate for that. So I'm going to be all that you need me to be. What is it that you want? What is it that you need? And so we're trying to hold on to something for dear life. And so if that means more sex, fine, I'll do it. But a lot of it uh, stems from one's low self-esteem, low value that they place upon themselves because of the crisis that they're experiencing with this particular affair. Another thing that I've noticed is that oftentimes when people begin to engage in sex after an affair, it almost becomes like a war of the roses. It's a love-hate or love war relationship. So think about passion. When you first entered into your relationship with your partner, it was very passionate. You were physically attracted to each other. You couldn't keep each each other's hands off one another, very passionate. But oftentimes when you're in the midst of crisis within your relationship and you're fussing and you're fighting and you're arguing and you're just yelling and screaming, that's also passion, right? And so oftentimes, after the affair has occurred and you're entering back into a sexual experience, you have two sides of the same coin. The coin is passion, but you go from a physically intimate sexual passion where you're pulling each other's clothes off to anger and rage and frustration and animosity, mistrust and just plain hatred. We've seen this before. So while they're in the bed, the intensity manifests in one way. When they're outside of the bed or the bedroom, that same intensity uh, manifests in another way way. There's nothing healthy about either one of those. Because what you're doing is you're redirecting emotions and not filtering them through a proper process. And that's oftentimes what we see. And so the question is, how do we effectively and in a healthy way transition when there has been pain, hurt, and an affair that has occurred within the marriage? Well, I would say rather than rushing into anything, rather than trying to fix the situation, it's a slow process. You have to understand that you are on the road to recovery. Now think about a superhighway. You generally have four to six lanes. You have the left lane, which is the fast lane. You have the right lane, which is the slow lane. Oftentimes, certain partners within the realm of a relationship are in that right lane and they're going tremendously slow. Now, on a highway, think about it. You have to travel at a certain speed to avoid an accident, to avoid chaos. But if you go too slow, you actually can cause a pileup. However, if you're going too fast because you just want to get past this and you just want to move forward in your relationship, you can be reckless and careless and also cause an accident. So there is a healthy process or speed or rate that a couple should go in. The challenge is this, you can't legislate for your partner how fast or slow they should be going. That's the challenge. And so the, the unfaithful partner has to be mindful that that hurt partner's journey is their journey. Now, I do believe you can get stuck in being stuck, meaning you're so stuck in what's happened, you're just not moving forward at all. Well, that means that there are unresolved issues, there are emotions that haven't been properly filtered, and so therefore you can't move forward. So one partner is literally a mile ahead, you're still behind, you're moving at different paces, or you're going in opposite directions. You're not even on the same side of the highway. One's going north, one's going south. There's a scripture that says, can two walk together unless they be in agreement? And in the midst of crisis, and in the midst of this conflict, and trying to figure out, do I even want to restore this relationship? We're going in two different directions. And the further are we are from one another, it almost seems like, you know, the, the future of our relationship remains bleak. But it's important that you remain on the same path. And so it is the responsibility of the unfaithful partner to be the builder of the relationship and to do anything and everything that is possible, right? To comfort, to be empathetic, to be compassionate with that hurt partner. Now, there's a transition at some point that even the hurt partner has to go through. What's that transition? See, initially it's a blame game. So the hurt partner is pointing the finger at the unfaithful partner and blaming them for everything that happened. But when you understand that the affair is one issue, but there may have been vulnerabilities or weaknesses within the relationship that led to the affair, and the hurt partner begins to recognize what other contributing factors may have contributed to that particular affair, it goes from being your affair 
to our affair. It becomes our affair story and how we are going to make it out. But that requires a whole lot of conversation. It requires a whole lot of compassion and empathy on both parts. And that's what's needed in order to properly transition. So when we're talking about sex, right, it's important that you realize it's more than just a physical act where two people come together and cause release. Now, when we're talking about sex, we know sex is, has four purposes. Purpose number one is what we will call procreation. That's when you actually have children. The second purpose of sex would be communication. The third purpose of sex is recreation. We just want to have a great time. The fourth purpose of sex is release. So in order to restore the relationship in the way that it needs to be restored, it is important that the both partners, the hurt and the unfaithful partner, enter into more communication in terms of what they're seeking in the sexual experience. So it's an opportunity for us to reconnect and participate in nonverbal communication. Remember, when dealing with communication, your words are 7% of your communication, your tonality is 23% of your communication, and your facial expressions, your body language, sexuality, and gestures are 70%. And so when you take the time and enter into what we call intimacy, that's when you've made it. Now, most people associate intimacy with sex, but intimacy is so much more than a sexual experience. Intimacy is the chemistry. It is the emotional connection. It is what the two individuals share with one another when they enter into the sexual experience. Just think about a prostitute once again. If you're having sex with a prostitute, there's no connection, there's no relationship, it's just a physical act. You both perform a duty and you go your separate ways. But when you're in a marital covenant with your partner, intimacy has to be a major part of the experience because I always quote T.D. Jakes, it was a phenomenal quote. He said that sexuality without intimacy feels like rape. And oftentimes the hurt partner typically feels raped, if you will, because it's void of the emotional connection. It's void of intimacy. And so intimacy, we're talking about emotional intimacy. We're talking about spiritual intimacy. We're talking about intellectual intimacy. So in essence, it's who you are outside the bedroom that contributes to what takes place within the bedroom. Let me just say, when dealing with how to engage in a healthy sexual life after an affair, it is important that conversations are had between the hurt partner and the unfaithful partner. And you can't force or race or rush someone to a place that they're not ready for. So really, it's going beyond the surface conversations about the sex and getting to the inner core of it all. Like, what is the apprehension? You know, what can be done, not for the purpose of, let me just be goal-oriented or task-oriented, let me do this in order to get the sex that I want, but what can we do collectively as a couple to get to a healthier place so that you are just as desirous for the sexual experience as I. Or if we're dealing with the type of couple where it's sex every single night and, you know, now the hurt partner, I mean, the unfaithful partner feels like, oh my God, like, is this ever going to end? It's just too much. I can't take this anymore. Um, it's important for you to have conversations to find out what the root cause of that is. Because if it's based upon an insecurity, an inadequacy, or a fear, sex is not going to solve that problem. It's not. It's almost like putting a band-aid on a gashing wound that's bleeding profusely. It requires surgery. It requires stitches. It requires something else. And so if you're using sex as a form to medicate a problem, it's not ever going to solve that problem. And we know that oftentimes people have used sex as a tool, a tool of manipulation, a tool of control. Uh, and so I think that when you take that type of mentality into the bedroom in your marriage, it can only lead to problems ultimately. So ultimately what I'm saying is in order for you to transition and be healthy in this particular space, you are going to have to open, you're going to have to enter into open and honest communication. You're going to have to transition from having surface level, level conversations to entering into what we call intimate conversations. Now there's a phenomenal book 
uh, entitled The Seven Levels of Intimacy. One of the best books that you could ever read on how to really develop intimacy. And it talks about how most couples never really get past the third level. Uh, without going uh, into detail, one of the first levels of what we would call intellectual intimacy is cliche conversations. So imagine you're pumping gas at a gas station, you're in the supermarket and standing in line, someone's in front of you, someone's to the side of you, you make eye contact, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Nice weather out here, isn't it? Oh yeah, the weather's great. Cliche conversations. You don't really care about the weather. You don't care about asking a person how they're really doing. It's just something that's nice and polite that you say. And oftentimes in our relationships, we have cliche conversations where all we're talking about are the bills, all we're talking about are the kids, all we're talking about is work, surface stuff, safe stuff. I think ultimately that's where it is. When you're entering into intimacy, you're dealing with a vulnerable atmosphere because I have to open up and share my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, my fears, my frustrations, and oftentimes that can be very that could be very vulnerable if I don't know where it's going to wind up. So if I take the chance and open up, but I'm rejected or I'm condemned or I'm shut down, it really keeps me from wanting to enter into that space again. And so that's why I say we kind of have to tread lightly and take one step at a time, not racing through the process, but slowly but surely testing out our partner, testing things out to see what actually works. And when you enter into a safe and secure zone, within the realm of your relationship, all of a sudden things begin to change in the sex which was once a tool, the sex which was once something that was used out of insecurity or fear or as a matter of control or a matter of locking someone down, now becomes a mutually beneficial experience that both partners enjoy. So sex is one of those things that we love to do but do not like to talk about. And so that is why, you know, Danielle and I wrote something called Pillow Talk. 50 questions of extraordinary sex. I can't tell you how important it is. Now, even if there's never been an affair, usually when dealing with sexuality, it's one of those tricky issues that we're not comfortable talking about because, you know, whatever, we grew up in an environment where we were always almost like put off about the conversation. Think about it. We've been dishonest about sexuality from a child because when a parent talks to a child about sex, you see how uncomfortable that is? When a parent is asking the child, so do you have feelings for a boy and, or have you been intimate with a girl? We kind of are misleading, right? We're deceitful, we're dishonest. Now, when you've been practicing that as a child all of your life, you grow up into the age of your maturation doing the same thing. So now when you enter into an adult relationship, it's just as nerve wracking, you're just as uncomfortable because you've created a habitual habit of doing that again and again and again. And so you've got to get to the point where you are free and open and transparent. You know, we don't mind being physically naked in front of our partner, but we have a major problem being emotionally and intellectually naked. And so that's why it's important that you have to really pace this thing out to the point where both of you are comfortable. And when you begin to do that, all of a sudden things change. So communication is essential in every aspect of a relationship. That's correct, Sheila. It's absolutely critical. And when you begin to do that, all of a sudden things begin to change. So without belaboring the point, if I could leave you with one final thought. If you want to have a healthy, mutually beneficial sexual experience after an affair has occurred. It is critically important that you seek professional help to guide you through a process because oftentimes our good intentions don't always work out. You've heard the expression that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so you have the right heart, you have the right motive, but maybe the way in which you do what you do, the methodology isn't working. And there needs to be course corrections. So if professional help means buying a book on how to recover, if it means going to a intensive where you're getting deep dive help, if it means going to a professional counselor that can guide you through a process, whatever you need to do, you need to do it. Insanity is doing the same thing, but expecting different results. And even when things are good, because there will be a season where things begin to turn around, and it seems as like, wow, we're out of the weeds, we're good now, we can coast. 
Understand that in your marriage, you go through seasons, right? There are seasons when things are phenomenal. And then there are seasons when it feels like, oh my God, my world is just falling, uh, falling apart all around me. Think about the four seasons uh, in life. You have winter, summer, spring, and fall. Winter represents death. Fall represents things dying. But spring represents the rebirth of something. Summer, it represents life. And so even within the realm of your relationship, you're going to have seasons of fall and winter. And while you're in your season of fall and winter, you want to be spring and summer minded. Because if you're spring and summer minded, it will shrink and shorten the negative season and help you transition into the positive season. But when you're in your spring and when you're in your summer, you want to embrace it. Don't start thinking about the future. Uh oh. Fall is coming. Winter's coming. No. Embrace your moment because marriage is nothing more than moments. Now, if you're having a wonderful, wonderful moment, you can extend that moment into two and three and four moments. So now you're creating moments back to back of bliss. But when you are in agony, if you meditate on it, though, you know, so much so, you can extend that moment of agony and now you enter into a season of agony. That's not what you want. So ultimately what I'm saying is seek professional help and that's what Couples Academy is all about. That is why we do these calls every single Monday night because we want to give you something that will spark an idea, that'll give you a new concept, that'll give you the, the I don't know, the stamina to stick through, that'll give you the audacious uh, mentality to say that, you know what, regardless of what we've gone through, we can fight this thing and we can win. And when you begin to do that, I'm going to tell you something. There are so many people who have better relationships after the affair, better sex after the affair, better communication after the affair. There's no residue from their past. You look at them from a distance, you'll never know that they went through the hell that they went through because they were willing to go through a process, right? They were willing to take their hands off of the steering wheel and allow somebody else to guide them through that journey to get them where they ultimately are today. And there's countless couples that are testimony, testimony of that particular uh, accomplishment. And so regardless of what you're going through right now, regardless of how bleak your future may look, regardless of how you may feel as if you're on shaky ground and you don't know from day to day, you know what life is going to look like. Some of you right now have uh, an imaginary luggage and bag packed at the front door, one foot out, one foot in, just ready to, to leave at a moment's notice. And I, I need to tell you that if you make a commitment to stay, if you make a commitment to fight, you will win. The scripture says that we're more than conquerors. Well, there's a major difference between being a conqueror and someone who's more than a conqueror. A conqueror is one who shows up for battle and wins. But someone who's more than a conqueror knows that he's won the battle before he even gets there. So it's all about your mentality. And guess what? The biggest fight is right here in your mind. When you think about sports, I remember Michael Jordan was being interviewed after he retired. They said, you know, when you think about your entire career, what was the most taxing, the most exhaustive part of the entire basketball career that you've had? And he said, you know what? As gruesome as the physical work was, it was the mind. It was the mental work. It was this right here that I had to control. As long as this was in control, my body did whatever my mind allowed it to do. But when my mind wasn't in the game, when my emotions weren't right, then you know what? I had some of my worst experiences on the court. And I want to let you know that you have to have a marriage mindset. You've got to be committed. You've got to have stick to itivism. You've got to be willing to say, you know what, regardless of what has happened, I'm fighting for this because guess what? It was promised in the word of God that I could have a phenomenal relationship if I live according to the scripture, if I live according to the laws and principles that make a relationship work. And even though we've had hell that we've just gone through, we're entering into a new season. And I'm committed to that. And when you make that commitment, it, listen, if you can have faith for your job, faith for your education, faith for your personal goals, faith for other people, why can't you apply that same level of faith to your marriage? And faith is not foolish. Let me tell you something. Faith, when you apply wisdom, meaning when you infuse wisdom into your faith, then it has exponential power. And then that power overcomes your marriage. And so I hope that this was helpful. Listen, you can have a great sex life. I don't care what you've been through. 
I don't care what you've experienced. I don't care what you're going through right now. If you're that individual right now who loathes the idea of being physically intimate with your partner, tomorrow's a new day. If you're that person who's constantly engaging in sex out of your own insecurity and fear or feeling as if you're not enough or trying to hold down what you don't want to leave you, you need to change up the way that you think and the way that you feel because if you have the right perspective, you no, no, you no longer have to use sex as a tool of control and you no longer have to fear it as if it's something that is like rape. It can be a phenomenal experience when you incorporate intimacy. So listen, thank you for the call. I want you to continue to tune in. I want you to subscribe to this particular uh, Facebook Live. If you haven't shared this yet, click the share button right now. Put it on your wall. Share it with other groups. There's somebody out there tonight that needs this message. Tomorrow is a special day for all of us around the world. I don't want the hangups of your past to impact your future. So apply these principles. Share them with those that you love so that change can begin to take place all around us. Couples are rising up all over the world. It's time for you to rise and take your place. Listen, we're offering two free gifts for you today. We have a book called 101 Ways to Love My Wife, 101 Ways to Love My Husband. If you want those free books, all you need to do is go to the Audacity of Marriage group online on Facebook, right? Join, and they're waiting for you on the inside of that group. Just click the file button, and they will be right there available for you. And if you apply the techniques that are spelled out in that group, it's not just about a day that you celebrate once a year, but it's about incorporating love into every single day of your life, of your marriage, so that bliss becomes the ultimate atmosphere of your relationship. Love you guys. See you next week.